called Paul Gadd fell in love with the sounds of rock and roll and wanted to be part of it. He built up a flamboyant and outrageous image and searched for a name to match. He turned down Stanley Sparkle, Terry Tinsel, and Oris to Horace Hydrogen, and he settled instead for Gary Glitter, the 70s rock and roll leader of the gang, and saw this rubbish. His fame waned for a while during a period of alcoholism, bankruptcy and depression, but the leader couldn't be kept down. Today, he tells the whole story in his autobiography, Leader, and he's still rocking after all those years with his new single, Ready to Rock. The one, the only, Gary Glitter. What a great audience. What a great audience. Hi. <laughs> Woo! Are you ready to yes. rock? Up. Yes. That was off my new album. Uh, which comes out on Attitude Records next week, and that's the single. Do you like it? Yes! I think they quite enjoyed it. The chapter in this book, Leader, is called Life is Not a Dress Rehearsal, which is really your motto, it seems to me. It is, yeah. I mean, this, this is it. It's, we've got to enjoy it while, while we're having it right now, I think. Don't you? It was an I do. I'm it all is. for it. It's such an incredibly young start in your case, though. Coming to London at 13. Yeah, I made my first music, record when I was 14 for Decca. Changed my name to Paul Raven, and um, it was the worst record in the world. Actually, it's called Alone in the Night. It was dreadful, and uh, up until about then, I went and made a record called Walk On Boy um, with uh, Ron Richards, who later uh, produced the Hollies, and then George Martin, who later produced the Beatles mm -hmm. with uh, Tower of Strength. Then I went to Ready Steady Go. How did a lad of sixteen though get in on Ready Steady Go? And the pop music business was phenomenally hard to actually break into. Um, well, I, I was managed by Victor Billings, who managed Dusty Springfield, and Dusty Springfield was a great friend of Vicky Wickham's, who, at that time, it was, it was crazy, actually, because Ready Steady Go started out um, with this audience participation thing in mind, but they couldn't get the audience to, to, to do what they were supposed to do, you know, like, Lead up! You see? And you could. So, <laughs> so, well, I've had a bit of practice since then. There's but, a few um, old ladies who came in here this morning. I have a clue what's going on. <laughs> but they're joining in. <laughs> oh, they'll all be at the NEC and uh, Wembley this year, no doubt. However, um, that was a plug for the concert. It went past by totally unnoticed. Um, but it was very no, we, um, we, um, so they, I'm, I was very lucky to get the job as uh, to, to ask the audience to come along to Ready Steady Go and I, I would sort of go around all the clubs because I was a bit street wise and I'd go around there and, and, and check them out. He had all the mod thing that was happening. And, and really it was Kathy McGowan, Michael Audrid and Vicky um, who put the Ready Steady Go together. And, and myself, we used to play the records on, um, I think it was a Monday and uh, we'd go through all the records. What was great about Ready Steady Go is it took a chance. Mm. You know, not only did we have the Beatles, the Stones, the Animals, all these groups on, but it took a chance with people like Donovan, who'd never ever been on television before, uh, Ike and Tina Turner, all the black Stax things, Dinah Ross. You took a chance on a commercial for mm. Cherry B. I didn't know it was your voice, but can you still remember? Cherry B, Cherry B, Cherry B. It's a cherry drink that's for you and me, Cherry B. There was a lady who was supposed to be a 13-year-old girl, and I, you know, and I turned up there. Um, she's supposed to have this really light voice. And uh, it, she, she was about, uh, I suppose, about 60 years of age. And she did the little girl's voice. Right? <laughs> and I turned around, and I didn't see her there before. And she said, it's Cherry B for me. 
Um, yeah, that was good fun. You made some amazing... Saved my, saved my neck, actually, because I, 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 I'd forgotten it about a year and I was absolutely broke. And uh, I remember uh, Victor, who was still managing me then, we got this cheque for 300 quid. Um, and we, we hadn't eaten for weeks, you know. We went to a Chinese restaurant, you know, and, and we ate a load of food and came out of the restaurant and threw up. I mean, <laughs> we hadn't eaten. You made some amazing decisions there. I mean, you worked with Tim Rice, singing the role of a priest on the album of Jesus Christ Superstar. The Halo. And he made you an offer. Yeah, they, they, um, they, they asked me if I would um, accept 1% or 40 quid. Well, I needed the money so, to pay the rent, so I said 40 quid. But in fact, if I'd have said 1%, I would have probably earned 200,000 quid. Wow. But that's life, isn't it? <laughs> you, you worked so hard for so long, and then in 72, the real break came with Gary Glitter having decided against Horace Hydrogen. And Vicky Vomit. <laughs> Terry Vicky Tinsel, Vomit. Stanley oh. Sparkle. <laughs> How did the look and the band come about? Um, well, we wrote, Mike Leander and I wrote Rock and Roll Parts 1 and 2, and I, really up till then I'd never written a song, and it was Mike's encouragement to um, say, you know, the only way you're ever going to get this audience participation thing over, um, like, do you want to touch, and everybody says, yeah, you know, like, you didn't, who did you? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to touch? Yeah! Oh, that's it, see, so to get the audience involved with your music, you've got to write it yourself. And, and, and once we started doing that and homing in on it, it became such great fun. You know, all the time you're working on these new ideas. Between 72, I think it was, and 75, you had about 11 hits. So yeah. what went wrong? Why did it all crash down around your ears? I think I'd, I'd been doing programmes like this every day from 72 to 76. I mean, I was, fo I was followed to the, the loo with a camera, you know. There was, I was always in makeup. I'd forgotten what Paul Gad looked like, you know. Pretty awful, actually, to be honest. I'd rather wear the makeup. <laughs> and um, I, I just needed a break. So I took all my weekends in, in one time and went on holiday for a year. And uh, uh, I just messed around. I'd been to Australia by that time 35 times. I'd never actually seen anything other than a studio or, a, you know, the inside of an aeroplane or something. And um, I started drinking rather heavily, I think probably because... It was a bit like winning the football pools, you know. I suddenly got all my money in one go. It was showing the uh, Wilson government. They, we were paying 87.5% uh, in mm. the pound uh, tax. So that was pretty crippling. Everybody was leaving the country, the show business, Wallers. And um, Rod Stewart said to me one day, we were having lunch together, he said, I don't know how you're going to hang on. I've got to go to L.A. because there's no way I'm going to be able to make a living or even live in the country. And uh, one thing after another, and, and um, my career... I bought a house, a beautiful house, and I'd never ever had a house before. As a family, we, it's all in the book actually, we moved around a lot. And um, so you know what it's like, you suddenly get house proud, you want to do the kitchen and the bathroom, and the bathroom, I, I remember spending about, uh, I think £25,000 on the bathroom. <laughs> Imported marble and all that stuff, you know. And um, also, curtains, designing the curtains. You seem to have had your fair share of sponges as well. It struck me that you had an awful lot of fans, but very few close and reliable friends? I think, well, I, th I think I did have some close, reliable friends, but I think that, that there was... It's, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a monster. Gary Glitter could be a bit of a monster, I think. Surely not. Oh, yes. And, and I think that, you know, it was a lot easier at that time to say yes, Gary, than to say no. But I, I was fortunate because, I mean, my hero was Elvis Presley, and when I got into the drugs and, and drinking a lot, at least I had people tapping me on the shoulder regularly and saying, don't you think you're going a bit over the top, you know? Did you also feel in a way that you, you, were, you were being disloyal to your fans? We had this whole great episode that was much yeah. trumpeted in the press yeah. about you were going to marry this girl, Mary. Yeah. And it was all totally phony and you came on yeah. chat shows like this saying, yes, this is what we're all going to do. Yeah. This. And yeah. you actually, you weren't very kind to I was, in that I was manipulated during that period. You see, there wasn't enough hours in the day to do all the press, you know, you, things like what colour toothpaste do you use and stuff. You know, so and I got lazy. I got a little bit lazy, and I left it to other people. Mm. And um, I was actually going out with Mary. So Mike, who's my manager, said, you know, or, or Tony Barrow, I think the press agent said, why don't you, um, you know, let's have a romance. So they started this romance. Mm. And when you get things going in television or in the media, it's very hard to slow it down. You know, it's it, that's a monster in itself. But the Glitter Gang show that we see with you now, this is the new improved, the real Gary Glitter. Isn't well, it? I, I, yeah. I don't drink. I haven't had a drink for six years. Uh, in fact, anybody 
you know, who's got a problem, try, try going running every day. It's a much better alternative. It's the best high in the world to, uh, to get fit and clean. Well, now that you're back on it and you are on that high, we, we sincerely hope you stay there. Stay with us thank while you. we meet our next guest. But for the meantime, thank you very much. Gary Glitter. Fan. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, much better outfit this one, Les, than the one you had on the top. Well, I thank infinitely you very much, prefer yes. it. How did you come to get the part? I wouldn't have thought you were an obvious choice for that. Well, somebody sent the script through. It came through the window around a brick. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so unusual, I thought I'd have to have a go at it. It was very strange. It wasn't the malicious rumour that I had put about that you, in fact, they wouldn't have to put much makeup on you. That was the general. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I've just been in the, in the makeup with Gary. <laughs> I came in the day before. He had a scaffolding. <laughs> he had a scaffolding around his chin. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to see you back again. Cause I've been a fan of you for many years. I'll tell you. Thank you. Because when he started off, Crossroads was a footpath. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Love the hair. Do you have it pruned? Yeah. <laughs> so when the script came through the door, I thought, well, it's different. It's very strange. In parts of it's very funny. And perhaps it's a little bit medieval. We're going to be seeing it this Saturday night yeah. on the Beeb. I just thought it was incredibly difficult to do. I mean, all that eating. Oh, it was a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I am a, sea I am a seafood eater. You see, everything I see, I eat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been one of the trouble. Th this thing, it was salami, uh, cheese and that sort of thing. And after a while, it, it, they were haunting me. D did you put on any weight? Oh, yes, I did a bit. Because I used to have a broad shoulder and big, you know, <laughs> deep chest, but that's all behind me now. But the thing was, <laughs> I did actually put a lot of weight on it. You know, How do you get it off afterwards? Well, at the end, I began to learn during the rehearsal, the rest of the thing was have a bucket judiciously oh, put me in. Oh, oh. Spit it. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but there's nothing worse than a salami. I don't have it. <laughs> well, it might have been something that we all, you know, like steak and kidney pie or something like that, but when it's suddenly something like that, it's just a bit off. Gary, you had the fight with the weight, didn't you? I mean, because you yeah. were putting on the pounds and knocking yeah. it off. How did you I, go? I, used to, I used to take those dreadful slimming pills, and, and if you start that, uh. that's the worst thing, because the minute you stop it, you put on twice as much weight. It's useless. Are you expecting after this huge row, I was going to say? We've got, we're not a slimming pill thing, no. It's four foot six <laughs> and weighs 300 weight. You put it against the fridge door and you can't open it. <laughs> 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 I'm <sorry about> that. <laughs> no, we're just on the, the, the wife, Tracy, bless her, she's, uh, she's put me on a reasonable... I got, got the weight off. I got down to 15. I was 17. Is this going to be the start of a new histrionic career for Dawson? I mean, it, will you go serious now? I'd like to do more of it, but I don't think... No, not altogether. You said, yeah, because you were offered the part of Falstaff for the RSC, Royal Shakespeare Company, weren't you? Yes, one was, dear heart. Why on earth did you turn that down? People would kill for a part like yes, that. Yes, it was the money. <laughs> <laughs> it really was, it was the money. No, I mean, the thing is, I couldn't afford to do it. But the marvellous people, you've got to sign for so long, and one day, God spared it me, I might be able to, if somebody dies in Tasmania, so well, old aunt. But I'd love to have done it. But I don't think you can put out all your eggs in one basket. I think you need options. And I think the older you get, the more you like to broaden out your career, yeah. don't you? you People know, are very willing more. to box you, aren't they? That's Say, the trouble. He does this, she That's does right. that. That's the tragedy. Yeah. You fought out of it a bit, Gary, with doing I did both Rocky and Horror Show yeah, and Slice and Saturday, Saturday, Night. Uh, Saturday Night, which was great. You see, a good musical, or a musical that works for me, um, comes every, about every 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't, you, don't find, you don't find parts that easy. I'd have thought Rocky Horror Show would have been a absolutely right for you, and yet you said not. Well, uh, yeah, but I mean, I, apparently I'm too old for it now. The legs are still good. <laughs> I got voted the best legs in New Zealand. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't do so good over here. But the thing is that, um, I know what he means. It, it, there comes a time in your life, and everybody has to reach this uh, wonderful audience. By the way, you've got a lovely audience. They're wonderful. Super. Yeah. Both of them, they were yeah, lovely. <laughs> when you get them from Rentish Round. <laughs> but the thing is, that when something comes up, you've got to take it. People say, oh, should you take the chance on doing it? You've got to. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're taking the chance on your own chat show. Yeah. Everybody has to move on a little bit, don't they? Even in real life, whatever you do. Moving on to the writing. Your 11th book and the other... Well, I've, I've met two or three of the others. I didn't realise that there were 11 of them. Yeah, 11, yeah. You write quite well, actually. Well, I use a pen. <laughs> Is, is that something that you can see yourself doing when you give up the, the day job, is actually going and being a proper writer? Some of that, Fred. <laughs> Don't you really phrase it well, <laughs> What a third-rate hack you are. <laughs> no, I'd like to do... I'd like to write books, and I'm, I'm trying to write books which are funny, I don't think there's a lot to laugh about in this day and age. 
So they just lampoons, for instance. Uh, well fared, my lovely, is a lampoon of the Raymond Chandler. Farewell, my lovely. From Barlow. From Barlow. I mean, the sort, it's got the sort of dialogue that people will itch to buy. <laughs> the opening paragraph is, the curtains were drawn, but the rest of the furniture was real. <laughs> <laughs> I mixed myself a little David cocktail. I call it that because when you have two, you have to go lieth down. <laughs> oh. Suddenly, my ears began to ring while I answered them. It was for a phone call in Spain from an agent called Ojo Antonio. He was on his audio. He had the O, you know. He said, there's a Russian spy coming your way. He's just broken into atomic laboratory, stole isotopes and dozy dopes and little lambsy diving. <laughs> now, with that sort of dialogue, you've got to buy it. Is it come as a disappointment that you're not shortlisted for the Booker Prize next week? Well, not particularly. There are other things in the offing, you know. <laughs> yeah. You actually, of course, did the first sequel to Gone with the Wind. There's a lot of fuss being made about the sequel to Gone with the Wind, but you I wrote Come Back with the Wind. Come Back with the Wind. This is what gets me. I was sponsored by Rennie's. No. <laughs> The thing was, well, I burp in hands with two in the bush. The thing was, I'd always thought I'll write the sequel to this, and it's based in, in Britain, where Lancashire, Yorkshire, Northumberland, and Cheshire break away from the rest of the country. And the wars, in, of course, the American Civil War started with the firing on Fort Sumter. In this book of mine, it started with the firing on Fort Dunlop. <laughs> but they couldn't charge because there was traffic on the M6. <laughs> <laughs> Very silly. <laughs> Do you find it easy to write? Is it, I mean, can it, does it just go onto the page very quickly? Does what go on the page? <laughs> well, you don't know, there's ridiculous statements. <laughs> does it go <laughs> on the page? Stand I've got a bad it? stomach. <laughs> no, it, no, it doesn't come easy. I don't think anything like that comes easy, does it? Nothing comes no, easy. No. Sometimes you get an idea in between the wife wanting something to do upstairs or whatever. <laughs> Your, yours is comedy. Gary, yours is very much actually pouring your heart out onto the page. A lot of people wouldn't have been quite so honest. Yeah, well, it's an autobiography. I mean, you know, I wasn't... I said to him, I don't think I've done enough, really. I mean, you know, I read David Niven or something, Moons of Balloon, he was 70 when he wrote that. Yeah. But, the, but um, they said that you'd actually been around for 33 years, you know, there's, there's lots to do, lots Gee, to talk gosh. about. But a lot of people think you're older than you are. You're 47. Seven. <laughs> There's a, there's a no. <laughs> that wasn't very polite, was it? That's, that's my fans. That's one of your fans. That's that's my fans like. 47, that's just one leg. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you see, they don't give him 47 for about 60 uh, years now. In, in my brochure, uh, I, you know, for the tour, it always says 27 and three quarters, official. And I've stuck to that for the last while, you know. You started very young, though. Like yeah. me, I'm 38 and some months. <laughs> 72. <laughs> How old were you when you started? Started what? In the stand-up <laughs> uh, You are getting her right. Well, it's not that. You throw these wobblers. I don't know. It's been that long ago, Mr Titchman. <laughs> uh, I was about 27 when I came out of the army. What did you do first? First thing you did? First job? Yeah. Oh, my first job was uh, working for the co-op. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's been downhill from then, really, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me, give, let, me, let me give you a tip. <laughs> you're hanging on with this job to the you tip. <laughs> Just because you've been given a chance because there's nobody else available, <laughs> don't knock it to <laughs> You can't do jokes while you're around. <laughs> uh, try to survive him on blanket. No, we're doing all right, you know. So we've got Nonna coming up. Um, mm. And are you doing your usual dressing up as a woman in panto this year? Yes, we're at uh, Wimbledon this year with uh, Dick Whittington. Nice cast, John Nettles, Ruth... Uh, uh, Rulalenska, bless her. Roly polies are there. They're smashing the girls. Wonderful. But they all bend down at once, you know, we'll lose an hour's daylight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing a spot of daylight into our lives. Well, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about Wimbledon. Well, hurry up, because you've got like 15 records. seconds. 15 seconds. It's great, this shows up. There you go, and sit here, don't you? Yeah, I love that jacket, by Thank the way. You. I'm going to ignore him now, but yeah. not for long. Gary Glitter and Les Dawson. <laughs> to these two and to Alison for helping me on my way with my You're first one. Well, Tomorrow, on. ex Monty Python, Eric Idle, wonderful back. series Sea Trek with presenters Martha Holmes and Mike DeGrew. They're in their futuristic bubble helmets sitting here. Why should tomorrow be different? Robert Powell and his co star in the play of Irish, prima ballerina Natalia Makarova. Music from Level 42, and I'll be here if I survive. Thanks for joining me. You'll do a good job. We're all